dwell. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith, which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call in, on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now this is a simple little passage. Most of us know it. And I'm going to title my message from these verses today, and I'm going to call it very simply, The Greatest of the Greats. Now how many of you know this name? Just throw some names at you. You know the name Babe Ruth? You all recognize that name? How many of you know the name? You ready for this one? Michael Jordan. You know that name? All right, now this one's going to shock you in an independent Baptist church, but you know the name Elvis? Shame on you. <laughs> I travel around the country, you know, some, and around the world, and it's amazing to me how many times when I'm in the Philippines or Moldova or Belarus or Haiti, and I start talking to people, they'll say, now, where are you from in America? And I grew up in Tennessee, though I live here in Ohio, and so I'll say to people, well, I grew up in Tennessee, and uh, probably eight times out of ten, people will say, oh, that's where Elvis is from. <laughs> people around the world know that name. Here's another name. You know this one? Billy Graham. You know those names? All right, now watch this. Many of us know the name Babe Ruth, but if I had to, I'd have a hard time telling you who he played for. Now, I know Michael Jordan because that was from my youth, the uh, Chicago Bulls. I know that one. You know, I don't know a lot about Elvis. I do remember that my parents had the world's largest CDs. Remember those? <laughs> they had a whole bunch of those and went to a revival service one night. And in that revival, the evangelist preached about honoring God and going overboard and having music that pleases the Lord in every detail. And my parents got under conviction about their CDs, their records, and uh, went home and threw every one of them away. That's what I remember about Elvis. I don't remember all about it, but I remember mom and dad throwing them away. A few weeks ago on Facebook, my aunt, who almost never posts anything on Facebook, she posted something, and, and uh, I went on to post where I was going to be. I usually post once a week. I'm at such and such place, and, and I saw my aunt was on there, and so I read her post, and she said, oh, do you remember where you were on this day? And, and she went on and on, and I thought, what happened on this day? And I scrolled down through there and trying to read. Comments were flying. And I thought, what in the world are they talking about? And found out that it was the day Elvis died. <laughs> My aunt's heart was really, really on fire about that. I mean, it really got her. She remembered where she was and what she was doing. And in fact, she said this. several. She kept posting, commenting back and forth. And, and uh, here's what she said. Oh, she said, he was the greatest of the great. You know, a lot of people would say, if you think of evangelists, they'd say, we know Billy Graham, he's preached face to face to more people than he may be the greatest of the greats. But you know what I've noticed? That people come and go. It's easy to forget. A lot of people wouldn't even know the name Babe Ruth today. I mean, they'd recognize it maybe, but a lot of people wouldn't. A lot of folks in a few years from now won't remember Michael Jordan. There's a lot of people who've never heard of Elvis. There's even some people who've never heard of Billy Graham. I was in Santa Maria, California several years ago, and I went out and got a Subway sandwich and gave the guy a track. I said, um, 
Hey, pal, my name is Dave Young, and I'm preaching at the church just down the corner, right down the street here, that church with the big steeple. I'm preaching a revival down there. I'm an evangelist, and, and this entire week I'm telling people how to be saved, and I'd love to have you come to my service, but in case you can't make it, I've got what I'm going to preach right here, and I gave him a track. He said, what'd you say you were? And I said, well, I'm an evangelist. He said, what in the world is that? So I'm thinking, now, how do you explain this? So I got this brilliant idea, and I thought, well, surely this would help you. I said, well, you ever heard of, uh, have you ever heard of Billy Graham? And he said, nope, never heard that name before. <laughs> that kind of caught me off guard. I thought everybody would recognize the name Billy Graham. You can forget anybody. There are four truths in our text today that many people as easily forget. But you know what? Um, you can debate uh, Babe Ruth or an Elvis Presley or a Michael Jordan or anybody you want to debate. But right in our text today are some of the greatest of the greats, and there's no debate about it. Here's four great truths that are timeless. Doesn't matter what generation we live in, doesn't matter what's going on in the economy or the government, these four truths are essential. Here they are. I'm going to tell you what I'm, where I'm going. In, in Romans chapter 10, in these 14 verses, you'll see the greatest need, the greatest danger, the greatest blessing, and the greatest responsibility. There is the greatest need in this passage. What is the greatest need in the world? You know, I suppose if we ask that question, we could get any number of answers. Somebody might say, well, you know what? A better government or a different one. A lot of folks are debating that today, aren't they? You know what we need is a better government. Our government is broke and we need a better government system. A lot of folks debate that and yet forget that the Bible says righteousness exalts a nation. It would uh, be great in some ways, I suppose, to have government that works better or maybe in our favor in a different direction. There would be all kinds of things we could change legitimately about many things in our society. But the hope for the United States of America has never been in a government system. Did you all know that? The hope for the United States of America never has, never has, never has rested in who's in a White House or who's sitting in a Congress seat or a Senate. All of that is important, culturally speaking, but the hope for America is right here today in places like this all over this land. It's righteousness that exalts a nation. Do you all believe that? So the greatest need is not a better or a different government. How about this one? The greatest need, the, I, know, I know, I know, I know what it is. It's more money. Because if we had more money, wouldn't it be amazing what we could do? If we just had better, more money, more money, more money. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to that necessarily, would you? I wouldn't mind having more money. Anybody here suppose you could spend more money? Anybody here? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I imagine that most of us could spend more, but the hope for the greatest need in the world is not more money. In fact, the Bible, I always love that verse that says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. In the Bible, so practical, isn't that wonderful, so helpful, so straightforward? I, I know, I know, I know, I know the greatest need, I know it, I got it. You know what the greatest need is? Some people would say, well, I'd like to have a better spouse. <laughs> I've had people say that. You ever heard that? Yeah, people say that. If I just had a better spouse, let me say a couple of things. Number one, don't be too hard on your spouse. You're the one who chose them. <laughs> and chances are they could have done better than they did too. Am I right or wrong? Don't be too hard on them. Listen, the best, the greatest need in the world is not a better spouse. I'm telling you, it's not a better spouse. It is not, it is not, it is not. That's not the greatest need. Better parents? If I had better parents, that's what I need is better parents. I preach to a lot of teenagers, and we do need better parents in this hour. I do believe we do, but it's not the greatest need. Do you all agree with that? Amen. We do need better parents, don't we? There's no doubt we do. But in Romans 10 and verse 1, you find the greatest need of all. It's to be saved. The greatest need in the world is for a man, a woman, a boy, a girl to be saved. Notice what Paul does here in Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be free from the Roman government enslaving them. No. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might have their own land again. It's not the greatest need in the world. 
The greatest need in the world, whether you're seated there in the balcony or listening to the internet or sitting on this main floor, the greatest need in the world is that you might be saved. Can't go to heaven unless you're saved. You can't be right with God unless you're saved. You can't be born again unless you're saved. Your sins cannot be forgiven unless you are saved. You got to be saved. You got to be saved. That's the most important need in the world. It's the greatest need of all. Can I ask you folks in the balcony a simple question? And I hope you'll examine your heart today. Do you know that you're saved? Do you know that you're on your way to heaven? Do you know that you're born again? The greatest need in the world is that you've got to be saved. Saved, saved. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The greatest need is to be saved. See, all of us are sinners on our way to hell. Do you, do you believe that? It bothers a lot of people today. But all of us are sinners, and that's obvious. Would you agree? You don't have to uh, be brilliant to figure that out. All of us have done wrong. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that you may be better than I am, I, I suppose that's possible, isn't it? You didn't vote. You could be better than I am, couldn't you? But you're still a sinner who's come short of the glory of God. I suppose it's possible that I could be better than you are. Is that possible? I asked that question in a revival in Missouri, and this lady up about third row from the front, she said, no. <laughs> kind of caught me off guard. I said, well, ma'am, the key word is possible. So I said, let me ask that again. It is possible, isn't it, that I could be better than you are? And she said, no. In fact, she was so adamant that I finally just gave up and said, fine. Be better than me if you want to. But it doesn't matter whether you are better or I am better. Both of us are sinners on our way to hell. It's what we deserve. All of us have lied, haven't we? It's wrong to lie. Do you believe it's wrong to lie? You ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Let me see it. You ever told a lie? If you don't raise your hand, stand up. <laughs> now, nobody stood, and first of all, I'm glad, because if you'd have stood, it really messed up my sermon. <laughs> but what if somebody did? Right here beside of the Velahopoulos's, there's an empty pew. What if there was somebody seated right there on that pew, and I said, you ever, if you ever told a lie, raise your hand, and if you don't raise your hand, stand up. And what if someone right there stood up, right behind Mrs. Folger, someone stood up? What if they did? What would all you people in the balcony think to yourself about that person who stood? You big liar, sit down. <laughs> My point is simply this. It doesn't matter whether I know you or not, both of us are aware of the fact that we've sinned against God because of our sins that we need to be saved you say well I'm not as bad as name it I, I've never murdered anybody and I hope you haven't I suppose that'd be true for all of us maybe not but I suppose for all of us you know the fact of the matter is whether you're a murderer or a liar you're still a sinner in the sight of God and you're on your way to hell greatest need in the world is to be saved because you and I've got to die life is so fragile isn't it Life is so fragile. Brother Korn is my assistant, and I hope you'll meet him as this week goes on. He's preaching in junior church right now. Brother Dave is uh, from Houston, Texas, and a few days ago, his brother and his brother's wife had twins. Beautiful baby girl and a beautiful baby girl, or a beautiful baby boy and a beautiful baby girl, and they weigh right at three pounds something, tiny little things. Well, a few days after the twins were born, his brother is driving to work in downtown Houston. And to this moment, we still haven't gotten a full report of what happened, but it had a head-on collision. And is in a semi-intensive care unit even right now. Life is so fragile. It, it appears he's going to be okay. There's still a question about whether or not he'll ever use his right arm again. He's a young man far younger than I Life is so fragile. I don't care whether you're older or young or dear friend, you and I live a fragile life and someday our life will end and we've got to die. The greatest need in the world is not for you to have a job or a better marriage or a better family. All of those things are important. And I'm against none of those things. But the greatest need in the world is for you to be saved. 
unless you get saved, you have to die someday and face God. God has so chosen that every person who goes to hell pays their own way. The wages of sin is what? If you and I were to die and go to hell, we would die and go to hell because we paid our own way. It's the price of our sin. Well, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner and God is so chosen that because of our sin, we are paying our own way to hell. If a man and a woman dies and goes to hell, God is so chosen that there will come a day they'll get a body and come out of hell and stand at the great white throne judgment. And the Bible says that God at that day will open the books and the name will be recorded in that book and out of those books, God will reveal to the entire universe that the sinner went to hell because of his sins. God will show that. God will reveal that. Dear friend, what a terrible tragedy to die and go to hell. Wouldn't you agree? What a terrible tragedy to stand someday at the judgment of Almighty God at what the Bible calls the great white throne and be judged and realize in the face of the entire universe that I sin. And because of my sin, I have to be paid. And my payment is I've got to go to hell. What a terrible tragedy that would be. The greatest need in the world is you've got to be saved. I want to suggest to you, you don't have to go to hell. I want to suggest to you, according to the Bible, you can be born again. The greatest need in the world, are you with me, is to be saved. Have you been saved? All you folks over here on this side, do you know that you're on your way to heaven the Bible way? All you folks here in this section, right over here in this section, you folks over here against the wall, do you know that you've been saved the Bible way? All you folks in the balcony, do you know that you're going to heaven the Bible way? You know what a man said to me? One time he left a service and he spoke to me out in the lobby and he said, Brother Young, you've said a certain phrase over and over and over again this week. You've said, are you saved the Bible way? I'll never forget what that man said to me. He said, I don't know much about that Bible way stuff, but I think I'm okay. I want to tell you something, dear friend. That's all we have to know what God wants. This is His Word, not ours. This is the Word of God. This is God's Word. It's inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible. This is God's word. So he says, yeah, but man wrote that. Men wrote what God told them to write down. This is a miracle book. And in this book, God is telling us unless we are saved, saved the way he says in this book, we can't go to heaven. Say, Brother Young, preacher, that's a little arrogant. Dear friend, don't think of it as arrogant. If God gave us this book, if God wrote these words, what God says is more important than what you and I think. The greatest need in the world is for a man to be saved. Can I show you something else? The greatest danger in the world is for a person to try to get to heaven on their own. The greatest danger in the world. Look at verse 3, would you? Notice in verse 3 what's happening here. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Now I want to ask you all a question and it's a little bit of a tricky question but I want you to answer it if you can, all right? Do you have to be perfect to go to heaven? Well, that's an interesting answer. Because you know what the Bible is saying right here? Do you have to be perfect to go to heaven? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a minute. That's not possible. Is it? You ever met a perfect person? You ever met someone who thought they were? Yeah, I have too. But now watch this. The Bible says this in the passage. That if I'm going to go to heaven, I've got to be a righteous person. The idea of the word righteous is that I've got to be perfect. Wait, 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 wait. Then I can't go to heaven. Let me say that again. Wait, 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 wait. Then I can't go to heaven. That's the truth. You and I can't. 
because we're not perfect. Notice the danger here in verse 10 is found in verse 3 right in the middle. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now let me ask you a question. Is your righteousness perfect? Anybody here perfect? But God's is. Catch what he's saying here. God has something that he can give us called righteousness that we don't have. And yet the point he makes here is that many, many, many people are going about to establish their, what's the key word there? Their own righteousness. How many people in our world are trying to get to heaven? I hope I'm good. Have you ever heard this? I hope when I die, God will weigh my good deeds against my bad deeds, and surely my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds, and God will let me in. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever thought that? I, I, I think I'm going to heaven because I got baptized, I go to church, I give money, I went to catechism, I, you name the religious work. I hope it's good enough. I have an evangelist friend who was visiting a lady recently who was not a believer, the Bible way, and she was rather religious but had never been saved the Bible way. And so she kept saying to him, yes, but I go to church. Yes, but. Yes, but. Yes, but. She had an answer for everything he said. And he kept going back to the Bible, and he kept saying things like this. You don't go to heaven by works. You don't go to heaven because you're good. You don't go to heaven unless you're perfect. And you're... she finally threw up her hands in exasperation, and she said, You don't give me credit for anything. <laughs> Can I tell you something? If you're talking about going to heaven, God does not give you credit for anything. Yeah, but, but, but I go to church. I hope you do. Everybody ought to go to church. I believe that. Well, I got baptized. That's a good word. But I give money to the church. Well, you should. It's fine. That's, that's God's plan that we do his work through the church. That's, that's his plan. But none of those things will get you to heaven. Yeah, but I'm a good lady. I hope you are, but it won't get you to heaven. That's going about to establish your own righteousness. But I love verse 4. This is a glorious verse. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know what the word righteous? It's, it's related to that word justified. You know that Bible word? Justified means to be declared righteous. Think of it like this. Justified means to be declared a perfect person. Open the record books of heaven this morning. Find your name. There's your name. In the record books of heaven on our own, there is a list in the records of heaven that you and I are sinners. What's on your record? Well, I'm a pretty... No, 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 no. What's on your record? I know one because all of you just admitted it. Liar. Revelation says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. The smoke of their torment ascends up forever day and night, and they have no rest day nor night. It's a terrible thing to be a sinner. Here's what Jesus Christ does for me and you. When we come to him by faith, in the records of heaven, the blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins. I don't think you caught what I just said. Here's what Jesus Christ does for us. When we come to Jesus Christ as a sinner who deserves to go to hell, and we trust him as our Savior, in the records of heaven, the blood of Jesus Christ washes away our sins. They are gone. They, I said they're gone. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our sins from us. He has cast them in the depths of the sea. He says, I will remember them no more. He says he cast them behind his back. In the words of a little chorus that we've learned many times, he says they're gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away your sins. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. 
of the blood applied to our lives cleanses us from all sin. Is that not a glorious truth? David, you don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. I know what he did when he hung on a cross 2,000 years ago and shed his blood for you in order that your sins might be taken away. In the record of heaven through Christ, our sins can be gone. Here's the other thing that happens in the records of heaven. The blood of Jesus Christ washes away your sins. There's your name. When you come to Jesus Christ, God takes the righteousness of Jesus Christ and places it on your account. The reason I'm going to heaven is because in the records of heaven, I'm perfect. Don't take that arrogantly. I'm just like you. I struggle just like you struggle. There are things I have to make right just like you have to make things right. But 25 years ago, I was a sinner on my way to hell. A man came into my life and told me about a Savior named Jesus Christ who died for my sins and was buried and was raised from the dead. And only through him, according to the Bible, could I be saved. And as a 15-year-old teenager, when I turned to Jesus Christ and called on him to save me, are you ready for this? He took away my sins and declared me a righteous, perfect. Do you ha a, a righteous person. Do you have to be perfect to go to heaven? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. But you can't be. And yet Jesus Christ died for you and offers you eternal life. And through him you can be forgiven. Isn't this a glorious truth? Here's the greatest need in the world. You've got to be saved. Here's the greatest danger in the world. You've got uh, trying to get to heaven on your own. Here's the greatest blessing in the world. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Anybody can be saved. Do you believe that? I said anybody. But Dave, you don't know who I am. I don't need to know who you are. I know who he is. He is the Son of God. And he died for your sins. And he was buried for your sins. And he was raised from the dead. And he offers eternal life to all who will believe. Isn't that what verse 4 says? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Yeah, but don't, uh, don't my good works count for something? No. Jesus is all. Christ is all I need. Have you heard that chorus lately? Christ is all I need. It's a glorious truth. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a Baptist preacher. I'm not going to heaven because I got baptized and joined the church. I'm not going to heaven because I pray with my family and try to live a clean life. I got saved. I came to Jesus Christ by faith and he saved me. He rescued me. He forgave me. I'm not what I used to be. I'm a child of God. And in the record books of heaven, my sins are God. Through Jesus Christ, I am now a righteous person. Have you been saved like that? Here's the greatest need, the greatest danger, and the greatest blessing. I love verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Look at verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto what? There's our word. When I come to Jesus Christ, oh God, I'm a sinner, and I can't save myself, and I'm religious, but that won't get me to heaven. I need Christ. When I believe on Christ, he declares me righteous. If nothing else puts you on shouting ground today, that truth ought to put you on shouting ground. Through Christ, through Christ, through Christ, through Christ. He's the one who died for you. He was buried. He was raised from the dead for you. He's alive right now. And he offers you eternal life. And if you'll come to him by faith, he will save you. You can leave this building today. You can get in your car. You can get on that bus. You can ride back to your home or go out to lunch or wherever you're going. And you can do so a righteous person on your way to heaven through Jesus Christ. Here's the greatest need. Did you get it? You've got to be saved. Here's the greatest danger. Did you get it? Trying to get to heaven on your own. Here's the greatest blessing. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Here's, here's the last. I'm done. The greatest responsibility. Let me ask you a question. Is salvation available? Can I want you to answer that? Nobody here but us. Is salvation available? Sure is. All who call, believing upon the Lord, will they be saved? Yes. Oh, yeah. All who hear the gospel and respond will be saved. Is that true? Yes. Amen. 
but look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Here's the greatest responsibility in the world. Greatest responsibility in the world. It's the greatest responsibility in the world. People get saved when they hear. They hear when we tell them. The greatest responsibility in the world. People get saved. People can get saved when they hear. If they're going to hear, we've got to tell them. You know what I think? Many of you in this room this morning, you're, you're, you're saved on your way to heaven and you love God and that's why you're in church this morning. But some of you seated in this service who are saved on your way to heaven and love God and that's why you're here in church this morning. It's been a long time since somebody heard because of you. It's been a long time. Some of you have got a son or daughter on their way to hell. You haven't had a real genuine burden for them in a long time. You've got a neighbor that's unsaved, and you, you really haven't done much at all, if anything, to try really to win them to Christ. You've got a mom or dad that's not saved, your grandfather or grandmother. You've got, you got a friend. You've got somebody, somebody you know, some business person you're associated with, and they're on their way to hell. And they might get saved if they'd hear, but they won't hear unless you tell them. Right here's four great truths. Would you agree that these are some of the greatest of the greats? Anybody here need to be saved today? Anybody here want to be saved today? Anybody in the balcony who's on your way to hell and in your heart you know it? You know it not in your heart. You, you know God has talked to you about it. You'd like to go to heaven, but you know you're not going to heaven the Bible way. This is your day. Today, 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 today is the day of salvation. Today. You may not have another time. You may never go to another service. You may never make it to another preaching opportunity. Nobody may ever speak to you ever again. This is your day, and this is a day you ought to get saved. It's the greatest need in the world. The greatest danger is you trying to get to heaven on your own because it's never worked for anybody, and it will not work for you. But the greatest blessing of all is that Jesus will save you if you'll come to him. And the greatest responsibility is for me and you to tell the world how to be saved. How long has it been since you had tears in your eyes about souls? How long has it been since you were genuinely broken about, about people being saved? How long has it been since you personally won somebody to Christ? How long has it been since you tried to win somebody to Christ? Here's the greatest of the greats.